Uh, I want to thank you all, uh, as Alan said, coming out on a Thursday evening to hear some of the things that I'll tell you about cancer. As I'm a professor at Boston College. I teach advanced uh, biology, especially related to cancer and some, and some general biology uh, as well. Um, and that's what basically uh, what my profession is. I'm a professor. But we do a lot of research, basic research on cancer. We've developed some of the best preclinical models that we can test and, and vet a variety of different approaches. And then I work with a number of physicians who are anxious to adapt what we're doing. Because my view on cancer is I think we need to vet these things clearly in models that replicate exactly what goes on in the human disease. So we're sure of two things. Number one is what we're planning to do work and does it not harm the subject? Because if we're, if we're able to get the disease managed without harming the subject, maybe we can now adapt this for the human. And we're starting to see some successes. What I just did was I took the, the data from the American Cancer Society. And we just, uh, uh, cases per year, new cases, deaths, and deaths per day. And we go from 90 to the last 26 years. And you know, some people say, oh, do we see a lot of good news in these numbers? Is that the number of people dying per day the increase for those 26 years is not as, as, not as uh, uh, dramatic as the number of new cases. So the new cases are flooding into the system, uh, and not only in the United States. This is happening in all, all countries throughout the world. Um, and in China, China is just devastated by cancer, more so than many other countries. So the good news is, is that the, the, the rate of deaths, the body count, is not increasing as rapidly as the new, the new people coming into the, and they say, well, we're making head roads. And then, of course, every now and then on the news, you're going to hear major breakthroughs in cancer um, uh, that we're seeing that for the first time, the death rate is going down. And you'll see a couple of those, of those um, uh, situations where it dropped here a little bit. And then you say, oh, we're making major. But then the next year, it goes back up again. And it's this constant increase. So you have to say to yourselves, you know, what, what is going on here? How is it possible? that our country and so many other countries are spending so much money on this disease and yet the progress in managing the disease is in my mind uh, not nearly what we, we think it should be. And it seems like we've, been, we've become complacent that cancer is just something we're going to have to live with and we're going to have to suffer with because it's part of, of, of our technological societies. And I'm saying no, that's not necessarily the case. What I have to do is I have to introduce you to the what we think cancer is. Because I think what we think cancer is currently by the establishment, the pharmaceutical, the academic industries, the federal government, uh, may not be correct. And I'm going to present evidence and let you uh, look at some of the evidence that we have accumulated here. Okay, so the question is, provocative question, is cancer a nuclear genetic disease or is it a mitochondrial metabolic disease. They're very, very different, very different uh, aspects of this. Because this is the cell, and we know that these cells grow out of control, and uh, this is uh, the nucleus of the cell. Now, according to the current view, the DNA right here in the nucleus becomes damaged, and that's what sends these tumor cells into uh, uncontrolled growth. The other problem, the other aspect here is that these little bean-shaped organelles that are in the cell, they're called mitochondria. And they're the organelles that generate the energy for our cells. They're, they're responsible for our respiration. So the question is, is cancer a genetic involving the nucleus as the primary driver of the disease, the mutations in the nucleus, or is it possible that it's these little organelles in the cytoplasm outside of the nucleus that might be the real culprits on this? And this is the focus of the first part of what I'll be talking about, just so you have an idea of what the balance, what we're really talking about here. Okay. So the cur current dogma is cancer is a genetic disease. And this paper by Hallmark's Next Generation, a very uh, commonly cited paper, it pretty much sets the, the whole playing field of what the nature of this disease is. Cancer cells carry the oncogenic and tumor suppressor mutations that define cancer as a genetic disease. Now, we call it a dogma. Uh, a dogma is an irrefutable truth. A dogma is something that's no longer questioned. A dogma is something that now is the way it is. We have dealt with all the other issues. This is the way it is. And uh, we're going to work within, within this mindset, which leads to an ideology. Now, 
uh, I say it's a dogma because I told you I teach biology and biochemistry and genetics at Boston College and any of the textbooks that you open up in the section on cancer, first thing, cancer is a genetic disease caused by oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes, which I'll go over. So this is the where it is. And, and this information um, is not questioned. It, there's no other alternative. You see, you're reading the books, the kids will memorize. So we've indoctrinated several generations of, uh, of scientists and physicians through our educational process, and therefore the research and the approaches to this disease come based on the dogma. Now, here's an example that they use in the textbooks uh, to illustrate this, the car. Uh, the, the dogma is based, platformed on the somatic mutation theory of cancer. And in my book, I go through a very detailed explanation of all this. Basically, mutations in genes inhibit or stimulate cell division and contribute to cancer. So here's a group of cells, they're growing out of control. And this is what we call cancer. It's a bunch of cells in the body that, and I'll talk about how they spread and all this other stuff, metastasis. But they use this car. Uh, the car is out of control. The, it's going as fast as it can. It, it has no brakes. And this is to represent these cells. There's no longer any growth regulation. The cells are growing like crazy because they have no inhibitor, inhibitor genes and the genes that stimulate growth are, are, are out of control. So um, now the, the research industry and our attempt to understand and manage this disease is based on these hallmarks. And these are the hallmarks that are outlined by, by uh, Doug Hanahan and, and, and Robert Weinberg, at, at, uh, who's at MIT. Um, now here, sustaining proliferation, evading growth suppressors, activating invasion and metastasis, enabling replicative immortality, inducing angiogenesis, which is the blood vessels that go into the tumor cells, and resisting cell death. Now you have to realize each one of these hallmarks is the subject of multi-billion dollar industries, okay? We have pharmaceutical and academic uh, 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 hospitals and labs focusing on, on one or several of these aspects, the so-called hallmarks. The concept, of course, is that if we can understand the mechanisms of these hallmarks, we can then provide better therapies for managing the disease. Now some emerging hallmarks that have come out in the last couple of years, avoiding immune destruction, tumor-promoting inflammation, genomic instability, and dysregulated cell energetics, which I'm showing you right here, and I'll be focusing on this so-called emerging hallmark, um, because I don't think it's the emerging hallmark, I think it is the origin, and I'll show you evidence for that. Now, to preserve the dogma, if you read these books and these papers, these scientific papers very carefully, they recognize this as an emerging hallmark, but they say dysregulated cell energetics is now an emerging hallmark, that is programmed by proliferating inducing oncogenes. This concept preserves the dogma. So the dogma, everything has to do with the nuclear gene mutations, and that's the origin of the disease. So whatever you want to look at, any one of these hallmarks or any of these differences, it's got to be based on the fundamental issue of the dogma, which is the somatic mutation theory of cancer. Okay, the singular most important aspect of the disease is metastasis. Because ultimately metastasis is what is most difficult to control and ultimately leads the disease itself or our attempts to manage the disease leads to the death of majority of people with cancer. So the interesting thing, and this is a, 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 di a, 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 a diagram or a picture, the green cells are the tumor cells and they go through this stereotypical cascade, met metastatic cascade. The interesting thing about the met metastatic cascade is that it's a very stereotype. Whether you have lung cancer, uh, colon cancer, bladder cancer, breast cancer, these cancer cells go through a very stereotypic process. Uh, local invasion, so the cells break through their normal barrier, intravasation, which means they enter into the bloodstream. This is a very sophisticated biological process. You can't believe the, the, the number of reactions that require cells to, that are not supposed to be in the bloodstream to get into the bloodstream. They have immune system survival. The immune system doesn't attack, attack them. They're immunosuppressive, and some of these new drugs you hear about, these checkpoint inhibitors and all this, they're, they're designed to try to make them more immunoresponsive. Uh, uh, in extravasation, so these tumor cells here in the bloodstream they, they leave the bloodstream and they enter into different organs or different systems at, at distant places. This is called extravasation and secondary tumor formation. And it happens when you start, your body starts to collect tumor cells. You can no longer use surgery. You can no longer use radiation. You have to then uh, fall back on these new so-called immunotherapies and these new tox old toxic drugs and whatever you want to do. You're trying to, you're trying to cleanse your body of these metastatic cancer cells, and then you hear all the time, well, they reverted, we weren't successful, they're coming back, these cancers are very tough, they're doing this and they're doing that, and everybody seems to be okay with that. So, 
let me present evidence that challenges the somatic mutation theory of cancer. And again, I, when I present this, some people don't want to see it, they don't want to talk about it, and they don't want to hear it. So, uh, but anyway, I'll proceed with it anyway. Um, now, one of the most interesting studies that was done by, done by um, McKinnell and his group, and I had a chance to speak to him, he's a professor emeritus at the University of Minnesota. And he did this study and published in a top journal, Science, 1969. And what he did is that there's a form of tumor in the, in the frog. It's the luck tumor. It's a renal, very deadly, rapidly growing malignant tumor in the kidney of the frog. So he took the cells out of the frog kidney. Here, here's the cell from the tumor cell, the tumor cell. And he removed the nucleus of the tumor cell that supposedly has the mutations that cause the disease. And then he put that nucleus into a fertilized egg and removed the, the natural nucleus and put the tumor nucleus into this new cytoplasm that contained normal mitochondria. And then you have this now new egg. And this egg developed into this tadpole that's shown right here. And he evaluated the tadpole. There was no abnormal, abnormal cell growth. There was no dysmorphic. There was no tumors. There was nothing that you would call cancer. Yet it came from this rapidly growing malignant tumor. The interesting thing about this study is that this tadpole, for whatever reason, there was something in the nucleus of the tumor cell that prevented the tadpole from maturing into an adult frog. So there was some definite, there was some problem. But the findings are inconsistent with the somatic mutation theory, which says that the genes in the nucleus are responsible for the abnormal cell growth. There was another study done by Beatrice Mintz at, at, um, uh, in, in Philadelphia at Thomas Jefferson, uh, Beatrice and uh, Carl Amensi. And they, they have a, a malignant teratoma, which is very rapidly growing, kind of an embryoid kind of tumor. And they took this, the whole cell out of that and they put it into a blastocyst of a mouse and they cloned a mouse that contained part tumor cells, part cells from the teratoma and part normal cells. And yet, the, and yet the mouse had no cancer and they were able to show that these tumor cells were not forming cancer in this, in this mouse. So their conclusion was conversion to neoplasia, which is this abnormal cell growth, does not involve structural changes in the nuclear genome. What does that mean? It, 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 this is not consistent with what we're told in the somatic mutation theory. It wasn't discussed. Rudy Yanish at MIT and his group did another study. Rudy is a very interesting guy. He's the leader in, in mammalian developmental biology. He is, he is the premier uh, mammalian developmental biologist. He saw those other studies and he said, I don't believe those other studies until I can do it myself with my system at MIT. So he took melanoma cells and he, from a, mel, a, a, a mouse melanoma and he characterized the kinds of mutations that were in the nucleus of the melanoma. Then he took the nucleus out of the melanoma cells and again put it into an embryonic stem cell and cloned these mice, this is one of them here, from the nucleus of the melanoma. And he found the same mutations that were in this mouse embryo that were present in the original melanoma, but this mouse had no cancer. It wasn't, it wasn't producing the phenotype that we would call neoplasia. So he says here, the presence of the major genetic abnormalities in the embryo cloned from the tumor nucleus provides unequivocal genomic evidence that these mice were cloned from the tumor nucleus, yet they did not present the phenotype that would be expected based on the dogma and the somatic mutation theory. Inconsistent. This was a more recent study done by Benny at, at, at Baylor College of Medicine, uh, Benny Kuropatu and his group. And what he said, what he did, he took very aggressive uh, breast, human breast cancer, uh, met metastatic breast cancer cells, and what he did is, he's, he has this uh, even harder technology. He removed the cytoplasm containing the abnormal mitochondria and put normal mitochondria with the still the metastatic nucleus. And before he did that, he characterized all these abnormal oncogenes, the ones that are supposedly driving the disease. And in the melanoma, they had very high oncogenes. And when he took and put normal mitochondria into this, into this breast cancer cell, the cell stopped growing and the oncogenes turned off, which was very like, what's going on here? In other words, the oncogenes are being controlled by the mitochondria in the cytoplasm, which is like completely different from the somatic mutation theory. So what I did last summer, I finally, after years, I put it in my book and then I extended it recently. Um, I, I brought together all of these observations. I only gave you a snapshot because I don't have time to go through all these experiments. The, the, uh, but you, they're, all in, they're all in this paper and they're in my book. So what I did, as I said, okay, we have, we have, we have two fundamental explanations for the origin of cancer. We have two fundamental explanations. One is the somatic mutation theory, and the other is it's not in the nucleus, it's in the cytoplasm and the mitochondria. Let's compare and contrast the observations from all these different kinds of studies and see what the results. And so I tell people, if you're interested in knowing the argument, read the paper, make your own decision. 
don't just listen to me. Look at the original papers. Read them for yourselves. I know that sometimes they can be somewhat technical. But that will, uh, you know, you're weighing, you compare and you contrast. And then as a, the rational mind will look at the information and say, hey, I, I, I think it's this way or that way. So this summarizes what I just said in a very simple cartoon. Um, normal cells <laughs> beget normal cells. Tumor cells beget tumor cells. We know this. Okay, what is responsible for the dysplastic cell growth and the abnormal growth of these tumor cells? Is it the nuclear mutations, is it the mutations in the nucleus, like the dogma says? Or is it the defects in the cytoplasm, the mitochondria? Okay, it was tested. So you'd move this nucleus into a new cytoplasm with normal mitochondria, and you got normal cells, sometimes normal tissue, and sometimes a normal mouse. And if you move the normal nucleus into the tumor cytoplasm, you get either dead cells or tumor cells. You never got normal cells. This is just the opposite of what you would expect if cancer were a nuclear genetic disease. So this is very hard information to, for, the, for, the, for indoctrinated people to swallow. This is very hard information to swallow, all right? Again, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to talk about it. Okay, so if somatic mutations are not the origin of cancer, then where do these cells come from? How do we get cancer if mutations in the nucleus are not the cause of the disease? So Warburg had this disease pegged a long time ago. A famous German scientist from the 1920s, um, did his work in the 20s and 30s, 40s and 50s. Uh, basically, Warburg said cancer arises from damage to the cellular respiration in cells. Energy through fermentation, which is a primitive form of energy, uh, gradually compensates for insufficient respiration. Cancer cells continue to ferment lactic acid or lactate in the presence of oxygen. This is called the Warburg effect. You see, we shouldn't be fermenting if oxygen is present. It's called the Pasteur effect. These are very complicated phenomena. If you put yeast cells in no oxygen, they throw out lactic acid. They begin to ferment, okay? But if you bring oxygen in, they stop fermenting and they start to breathe. Respiration is breathing. Cancer cells continue to ferment even when oxygen is present. So this is, this is an aberration. This is an abnormal th thing. All cancer cells, to one degree or another, are fermenters, all right? So, then the enhanced fermentation is the signature metabolic malady of all cancer cells. So when we look at cancer from the genomic atlas, the cancer genome atlas, we take someone's tumor and we spend a lot of money fragmenting thousands and thousands of mutations and cataloging all of these mutations. And what we find is that every cell in the tumor has a different constellation of mutations. So the goal of the personalized medicine is essentially to try to target different kinds of pathways from these mut mutate, mutated cells to try to manage the disease. But every cell has so many different kinds of mutations. How are you going to build a cocktail of, of targets when every cell is different and they all have constellation? This is the strategy. This is called personalized medicine, which is being done today. Now, that's one. Okay, that's what I just said. Is it, just think for a minute. Do you think that's the wise strategy? Now, if every cell in that tumor is fermenting to some degree, regardless of what the nuclear mutations are, and we know what the fuels are that these cells are using to ferment, doesn't it make sense that you might want to uh, deprive those cells of those fuels they're using to ferment when all of them are doing the same thing to one form or another? Why are we not doing that? So when we talk about respiration, it's not, it's, what is respiration? We breathe air. We're sitting here right now, tonight. We're breathing, right? Nobody's fermenting. Even if you're falling asleep, you're not going to be fermenting. You're still going to be breathing. So we breathe in air and we exhale, all right? We breathe in oxygen. And the waste products of fermentation are basically carbon dioxide from the foods that we ate and water. That's the waste product, all right? And we get most of our energy by breathing. We breathe. And we get very little energy by primitive fermentation processes, this um, uh, glycolysis in the cytoplasm. And we get a little fermentation energy from the Krebs cycle, the TCA, tricarboxylic tri tri acid cycle. So you can see 5%, 5%. Most of our energy comes from breathing. We breathe in air. Oxygen, oxygen is what's keeping us going. The cancer cell is very different. The cancer cell gets a lot of its energy from these more primitive forms. These primitive fermentation processes existed on the planet before oxygen came two billion years ago. We had a lot of organisms back then, but they fermented. There was no oxygen. How were they going to grow? And they grew like crazy. They proliferated and then they died. When there was a food source, they could grow like crazy. When the food was stopped, they died. Okay. 
So cancer cell is simply a shift away from breathing, away from respiration, to processes involving fermentation. So I went through and I showed you that this is the mitochondria inside of an electron microscope, because these organelles are very, very tiny. You need an EM, electron microscopy, to see them. Here's the organelle broken down into its various components. These little stripes that you see here, these stripes, they're called cristae. They are the, those little membranes, cristae, contain the proteins and the lipids that allow us to breathe, to get energy from oxygen, all right? We breathe in, and those little, that's electron transport chain in action, right? And those little stripes. This is the mitochondria from a glioblastoma multiforme, a very deadly human brain tumor that you've heard probably a lot about with uh, Senator Biden's son and uh, others that have had these horrible tumors. Uh, and there's a crystallosis. You see, those little stripes are missing. We call this a ghost mitochondria. The very structures that are responsible for us getting energy from re respiration are missing. This organelle is not going to be able to produce sufficient energy by, by respiration. So if that cell, that tumor cell, is going to live, it has to get an energy from a different source. And that source is this primitive form of energy called fermentation. Now, we, I want to go back and say that we don't know of any cancer cell that has completely normal numbers and function and structure of mitochondria. When you look at tissues, in culture you might see a little bit different, but when you look at solid tissues, you usually see that. Okay, so what we have to do, if we're going to redefine what the nature of cancer is, we just can't ignore all of the other information that's happened through decades of research by the top medical schools and the top labs throughout the world. We don't ignore that stuff. We just have to re-explain it. We just have to provide an alternative explanation for what we, what, we, what we have a new way of looking at the same information. The information is not going to change. We have mutations in the nucleus. Yes, there are mutations in the nucleus. Yes, these cells uh, ferment. They don't respire. Yes, they have all of these things. So how do we reconfigure the origin of the disease in light of a reanalysis re of the information about the disease? So we have to go back to the hallmarks of cancer like I showed you that the dogma is telling us, and we have to be able to re-explain the dogma in light of an alternative explanation for what the disease is. And that, and that explanation is mitochondrial metabolic disease, but we have to first deal with the paradox. The oncogenic paradox has stumbled many scientists in this field, okay? So let me just say for a minute, what is this oncogenic paradox? It was first pointed out by Albert St. Georgi, uh, who was, uh, won the Nobel Prize for his work on vitamin C. He said, there's a problem here. There's a problem, and it's the paradox. How is it possible that so many provocative agents that we know are linked to the origin of cancer could produce cancer through a common pathophysiological mechanism? Okay, and if you want to see, if you, any of you have read uh, um, uh, Siddhartha Mukherjee's book, The Emperor of All Maladies, it was on the New York Times bestseller list. He won the Pulitzer Prize. Um, Ken Burns, uh, the famous movie guy, he just produced a film on The Emperor of All Maladies. I mean, he got a lot of press, a lot of people heard about this. Look at page 285 in Mukherjee's book. He's struggling with the oncogenic paradox. On 303, he struggles with the oncogenic paradox. Look it up. So he said, how is it possible? We know carcinogens, carcinogens in the environment cause cancer. Radiation causes cancer. Hypoxia, inflammation, rare mutations, uh, RAS oncogene, viruses, uh, age. Uh, the older you get, the more likely you get cancer. Viruses, hepatitis C virus, papillomavirus, HIV virus, they all cause cancer. They all damage the respiration. They all cause problems. They all generate reactive oxygen species in the organelle called the mitochondria that's supposed to give us energy. Okay, and then people say, well, what about the rare, what about these people who get, like Angelina Jolene gets a BRCA1, she has her, her breast removed, her ovary and whatever, and other people do these prophylactic responses because they inherit a gene, therefore cancer must be a genetic disease because the gene causes it. Lee frau many syndrome, ovarian and brain cancer, and a variety of other cancers caused by inherited mutation in P53, the tumor suppressor. Those mutations knock out and influence the function of this organelle. So they're really secondary causes, as is carcinogen, radiation, and hypoxia. All of them work through the mitochondria. And the ROS, reactive oxygen species, these ROS are carcinogenic and mutagenic. That means they cause mutations and they produce cancer. 
So the ROS come from damage. These things in the environment or inherited damage the organelle. This produces reactive oxygen species. These reactive oxygen species further damage the organelle, and they also cause mutations. So now we go back to the, the, the dogma. The dogma says cancer is a, a disease of somatic mutations. Where are all these somatic mutations coming from? They're coming from the ROS generated by the mitochondria. So are they the cause of the cancer, or are they the effect of the cancer? Which I should say, not the cancer itself, but the initiating cause of the disease. Because then the disease progresses. Now these little organelles signal the nucleus and says, we're not, we're not able to get enough, uh, we can't breathe, basically, we're, we're suffocating. So the cell has two choices. The cell can either die, it can say, well, you suffocate, you're going to die. You hold your breath long enough, you're all going to die, right? Okay, or you can turn on genes that are going to upregulate primitive pathways that existed long time ago, millions of years, that were evolved, and you ferment. And all cancer cells then begin to turn on these oncogenes, and the oncogenes are transcription factors to upregulate these primitive energy pathways that existed on the planet before oxygen came in. So we're, these cells are, are uh, going back to a state that organisms on the planet existed in uh, a billion years ago. So now they become free of regulation. So that what was normally regulating the mitochondria is now becoming dysfunctional. Now we can begin to link the hallmarks of the disease to this linkage scenario. As the cells stop respiring, stop breathing, they start fermenting. The red line is indi indicative of fermentation. So your cells, the, the mitochondria become progressively damaged because this is an evolving, escalating situation. Now the cells enter the default state. All of these first three hallmarks, these cells flip to the way they were before oxygen, which is dysregulated cell growth. They proliferate. As long as food is there for fermentation, these cells will grow like crazy. Then they, because cancer looks like a wound that doesn't heal, blood vessels come in. So this is the angiogenic thing that we spend millions of dollars Billions of dollars trying to figure out this process here, driven by VEGF. And then we get why the cells, the, normally when a cell gets sick, it dies. It's a, it's a programmed cell death, apoptosis. The cell begins to die from a program process. The very organelle that, that is the, the, the kill switch, so to speak, the, the very organelle that's the kill switch to get rid of a dead cell or a sick cell is broken. The switch doesn't work. These cells are now dysregulated and they continue to proliferate as the result of this fallback and they're lacking it. Now, where does metastasis come from? Because that's really the thing. You can talk about, a lot of what I've already spoken about happens in benign tumors as well. And yet we spend, you can't believe how many, we spend more money studying benign tumors than we do studying metastatic disease. How do we get metastasis? Okay, here's the scenario. Here's a normal population of cells. They get provoked by, one of the, the, by, by, by something in the environment or, or a, uh, chemical, radiation, virus infection, age, whatever. They start to proliferate, but they don't spread. They form a lump or a bump and they continue to grow, maybe very microscopically. The cells of our immune system, the macrophages that signal that there's something disturbed in the microenvironment come in and they come in as wound healing cells and the wound doesn't heal because they throw growth factors out to help heal these wounds. They don't know that these are abnormal cells, so they throw growth factors out. And this is all, these cells are scripted. They're evolutionary, metabolically scripted. They don't think, they don't have minds. They do what the environment tells them to do based on the, on the situation. Now, what happens, these cells are so effective at healing wounds that if the, cell, if the, the cells they're trying to heal the wounds don't heal, they actually have, are very fusogenic. In some ways, they actually fuse with each other and with other cells to say, okay, I'm going to actually take care of this by fusion. Now, what happens is organelle transfer. I said these have damaged respiration, mitochondria. Uh, gradually, as this festation uh, 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 continues, the, the mitochondria inside these red cells, these MACs, become displaced by the mitochondria from the abnormal cancer cell, these non-metastatic cells, and now you have these cells here. These are hybrid fusion cells. These macrophages are, are, they go through our body. They are the sentinels of our body. They enter and exit tissues. They're programmed to do this. If you cut yourself and bacteria get into the skin, the macrophages come in, kill the bacteria, heal the wound. Now we have dysregulated, out of control macrophages that now they, are, they enter in entravization, extravasation. This is what they do. They're genetic. You don't have to envision new mutations to do this. And there's a number of cancers that can't find any mutations in these things. All right? Now, the interesting thing here is these guys are glucose and glutamine driven. Okay, their behavior is glucose and glutamine driven. That's what they do. 
So if most cancers uh, express the Warburg effect as a result of impaired respiration, what therapies might be effective in managing and preventing tumors? Now, you see, once we, once, once we have a clear idea of what the nature of this disease is, okay, once we know, oh my God, it's not a genetic disease, despite the fact that we're spending billions of dollars in this, in this, in this failed e e effort, and the, the, the body count tells you that, um, Okay, now what can we do? All right, so these cells are now dependent heavily on glucose and glutamine. So what we want to do now is we want to try to see what we can do. One strategy is to try to reduce levels of fermentable fuels while elevating levels of non-fermentable fuels. One of the ways we did this initially was calorie restriction. It's a metabolic uh, cancer intervention. It involves a total dietary restriction, differs from starvation, maintains minerals and nutrients, and enhances mitochondrial biogenesis, which is really important because you can build new mitochondria by, by simply stopping eating. Um, but you've got to realize this is not easy. No one, I always said people love to talk about calorie restriction on a full stomach. <laughs> believe me. Believe me. I go around, you know, even I talked to the last, last week, I was out talking to the Calorie Restriction Society of America. You know, those guys there, you know, they, they don't eat anything, right? They, they share a grape when they have a meeting, you know. So, um, but any event, they, they, but they, it's very hard to do that. Okay, so calorie restriction in mice mimics water-only therapeutic fasting in humans. What does that mean? I just drink water. You mean I can't have a snack? No snacks, just water. All right, what about, what about, a no, just water. Oh, geez, that's pretty tough. How long do I got to do that? Can I, can I do that for an hour or two? No, 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 you got to do it for like a week. Oh. I don't, that's all that. I'm walking the other way. So, um, but anyway, you, you're going to see some, and we've, we've do documented differences between mouse and man because the mouse, his heart rate is 600 beats a minute. You know, if our ha heart rate was 600, my head would blow off my body. So, um, so you have to realize what we see in the mouse. Oh yeah, look at that mouse. Only has to eat 40% less. And look, he gets his tumors gone. Uh, doesn't work that way in us. All right. So anyway, when you stop eating, uh, blood sugar goes down. All right. So your brain needs all the sugar. If your, if your blood goes down too far, you, you fall unconscious. You've got to call the EMT. It gives, you, uh, it gives you a chiclet or something, makes your sugar go back up. Hey, what happened? So, so what happens is, but you see, it goes down gradually. It doesn't go down too fast. You stop eating, blood sugar goes down because insulin goes down. Insulin goes down because blood sugar goes down. Your body says, hey, when is this guy? Then I say, I get hungry. I've got to go back and eat some stuff. I get my, my sugar back up again. I feel good. All right, so, but if you don't go back and get something to eat, the body says, okay, this guy's not going to get something to eat. If we don't get something to eat soon, we're going to go unconscious. So the brain has, to, well, has an alternative. It burns ketones. Where do you get ketones from? Fat. Okay, we, we evo evolved, to, we're evolving, spe our species, you, us, we, we survived. We're supremely designed to not eat. Now, you put an organism, the human being, in an, in an environment. This organism, we, us, were designed to survive for long periods of time without food because we have an incredible capacity to store energy. What happens when you take this kind of an organism and put it in an environment where all this food is glucose, as much as you can eat, wherever you want to go, everywhere on the, the, the store, the donuts, the pizzas, you get fat, right? This is, this is what happens. Now, what happens now, you can mobilize that fat if you stop eating. The fat goes, the, you take it out of your fat, goes to the liver. The liver now brings these ketone bodies, and the brain begins to burn ketone bodies. This is how we function when we don't eat. So these water-soluble ketone bodies are an alternative to glucose, and they can then replace glucose. The problem is the tumor cells can't use these very well. They need a good mitochondria to burn ketones, and the tumor cells don't have that. And here's just a quick, quick diagram. So a brain tumor cell, we work with a lot of glioblastoma, a lot of brain tumor. Glucose comes in. Under normal conditions, the glucose would be fully oxidized and you'd produce CO2 and water. But the tumor cells don't, can't use the, the uh, they can't fully oxidize or breathe, so they produce a lot of waste. Lactic acid is a waste product of, of glucose fermentation. It creates acidity in the microenvironment, acidity. It causes inflammation and all this kind of stuff, and the tumor gets worse. So we lower glucose, and we bring in ketones. They bypass. The problem is the tumor cells can't use these ketone bodies effectively. So we're essentially starving. We're metabolically marginalizing the tumor cells. We're taking away their prime fuel, which is glucose, and we're offering them up an offering of an alternative fuel that all the normal cells in our body can burn effectively because we evolved to do that, but the tumor cell can't 
because it has these defective respiration. So here's an example of a mouse. Uh, this is uh, ad libitum means this mouse was allowed to eat all the food that it wanted. It's a high carbohydrate standard mouse chow diet. And we just restricted the amount of calories by 40% three days after tumor cells were implanted into the brain. And we can get anywhere from a 65 to an 85% reduction in the size of the tumor simply by restricting the amount of calories that this mouse ate. Now, we also show each one of these little squares is a mouse under a different uh, diet. And you can see uh, as glucose goes down, going from higher to lower, ketones go up. This is the evolutionarily conserved adaptation. Happens in the mouse, happens in the rat, happens in humans. As glucose goes down, the tumor weight goes down. Since we published this, it's been replicated in humans for brain cancer and breast cancer and colon cancer. You eat less sugar, the tumors don't grow as fast. Now, what is the mechanism by which it works? It targets three of the prime hallmarks of cancer. It's anti-angiogenic. It stops the blood vessels going into the tumor. It's anti-inflammatory, and it's pro-apatonic. It kills the tumor cells by a non-provocative uh, mechanism. It's called programmed cell death. Each one of these processes is the subject of multi-billion dollar industries building drugs that can be anti-angiogenic, anti-inflammatory. Bevacizumib, Avastin is one of these. You know, it doesn't work. I'm going to explain that. Anti-inflammatory drugs, 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 drugs. If you stop eating, you get the same effect, right? Nobody tells you that. 